in the earth that can be used to heat houses. It's a clean and renewable alternative to fossil fuels, but right now it's only being used in less than 1% of Canadian homes. So why isn't everybody trying to tap into this energy in the ground? It's a mystery to those who have long understood the potential offered by the physics of heat. It sounds complicated, but the principle is simple. Heat travels from something warm to something colder. So when you put a pipe into the ground and fill it with a liquid that is colder than the earth, the liquid will absorb heat from the ground. A heat pump brings the liquid to the surface and into a heat exchanger in the home. The heat is extracted and a fan blows it throughout the house. The liquid is pumped back into the ground to start the entire process all over again. In the summer, the system is reversed for home cooling. Still confused? Most people are at first. Again, it's because they're uneducated about it. If they, if they knew what they could do, if they had their own piece of property, and they knew that there's enough energy on that piece of property to heat their house for a quarter of the cost they're now heating it for the rest of their lives, then I'm sure they would go to the geothermal. But because they don't know about it, they, they don't select it. So how are you making that for this one, Trevor? Is she going to be ready on time? We have to get that Glenn Kay has tomorrow. been making ground source oh, yeah, heat be, pumps uh, since the early 80s. Wires, yeah. Suddenly, his factory in Petticodiac, New Brunswick, is scrambling to keep up with demand. When we started selling them, we were trying to sell these things based on a, an energy payback and a saving for your customer. But I think in the years to come, the fact that uh, we're going to produce only one quarter the amount of greenhouse gas emissions compared to a uh, straight electric or an oil system or so on and so forth is going to be an even more significant factor uh, than saving money. So what's the downside? The initial upfront cost is higher than conventional oil or gas furnaces and it will always need electricity to run the heat pump. But it's one quarter of the electricity of a normal heating system and it means homeowners are no longer vulnerable to increasing oil and gas prices. You're realizing a savings after the five to seven years and you have, I guess, free heat. There are several ways to install a system, but in cramped city spaces, it's usually done with holes drilled into the ground. I'm sorry, there'll be nine holes here. Uh, the, the, this one here is 250 feet. Down. Down. Down the holes, they install pipes, which will be filled with a liquid, usually water mixed with ethanol. Those pipes are connected to a heat exchanger inside the home. Basically, this is the geothermal heat pump system here. The house doesn't need a furnace anymore. It's all inside this metal box. During the energy crisis of the 70s, Ottawa hired scientists to start developing geothermal energy in Canada. What they found was that in addition to the ground source heat available in every Canadian backyard, there were some places in Canada that could offer something else. Water so hot it could turn turbines and generate electricity. Iceland gets almost all of its power that way by tapping into underground volcanic activity. There is some of that in Canada at Meagre Mountain near Squamish, British Columbia. A private company has drilled deep into the rock to tap into thermal water for a commercial power plant. And there are other places in Canada with subterranean hot water that could be used this way. Back in Petticodiac, Glenn Kay worries that Canada is losing time in the fight against climate change. If you read anything about green, you know, our, our greenhouse gas emissions and the time we have to try to do anything to prevent global warming from happening, we've only got a window of about eight years. So if it takes our governments more than eight years to get their act you know, into gear and uh, start to promote all technologies, not only ours, we're going to be in serious trouble. We're going to miss the window of opportunity and then no matter what we do, uh, we're going to be chasing the eight ball basically. So that must frustrate you. It does frustrate me, actually. It frustrates anybody that's in this business or anybody that's in the energy business. But as maritime geothermal races to keep up with the demand, it's clear that word is spreading about the best kept secret in renewable energy. Kelly Crow, CBC News, Petticodiac, New Brunswick. In Nova Scotia, a paper mill is trying to become the greenest mill in North America not just by reducing its emissions of greenhouse gases, 
but also by not chopping down trees. The CBC's Tom Murphy has that story. A pulp company. You're thinking big polluter, right? Not so at Minus Basin. At this paper mill, they're proving that industry can go green. Take the trees, for example. They don't use any. This company's pulp actually comes from recycled cardboard. They were the first in Canada to use only 100% recycled fiber. Sure, there's times when if somebody was to say, look, it, you'd make a lot more money if you started cutting trees down. Would you do it? And we wouldn't. It's ingrained in us. In fact, this company was green back when green was just another color. In the 1930s, its founder, R.A. Jodry, saw the value of renewable energy. So we built these hydro dams. They still provide much of the power to the mill. That's cheap and clean power. These are the dryers. Like other mills, Minus Basin recaptures the heat it produces and reuses it. It's the first installation of that type of system on a paper machine in North America. But unlike many, this company also recovers the heat a second and third time, which means even less fuel is used, so fewer emissions. They also recycle all of their water instead of dumping it. It all means a savings that will soon be turned into revenue. In another month now, we'll be selling carbon credits due to the reductions we've made in the mill uh, in the Chicago Exchange, and we'll, we'll be making money on that. Now, Minas Basin wants to become the greenest mill in North America. Soon, the Bunker C oil tanks will go, replaced by a biomass fuel supply and cleaner emissions. Being green is part of the corporate DNA here. We technically are a paper mill that cleans up the environment, and we're darn happy to be able to say that. The numbers are impressive. Each year, 1.5 million trees are spared, 270,000 tons of greenhouse gases averted, and enough electricity saved to power 38,000 homes. Some of these rolls weigh about three, uh, three and a half uh, tons apiece. All of this while hundreds of mills across North America have been closing. The way Minus Basin sees it, going green may not just help save the planet, it may help save this company too. The hope is that by being the greenest, they'll be able to brag a bit, charge a premium price for their paper, unheard of in a day when so many other mills can't make ends meet. We can go to the Walmarts, we can go to the L.L. Beans, we can go to these companies and say, we are now a green mill. This is a big advantage to our company and our, and our market. And Minus Basin is not stopping there. The company wants to carry on in its tradition of renewable energy, this time tidal power. The nearby Bay of Fundy has the world's highest tides. At mid-tide, the flow is greater than all the rivers and streams in the world combined. An awesome supply of renewable energy that's just waiting to be tapped. Minus Basin is part of a group looking for environmentally friendly technology to harness the energy of the tides. If they're successful, they'll put turbines similar to these underwater. And at the end of the day, we've made more green, renewable electrons to displace fossil fuel-driven electrons that are taking place in this province now. So it is very exciting. This from a company that's trying to prove that thinking green might just help put more green in your pocket. Tom Murphy, CBC News, Hansport, Nova Scotia. Cars and trucks and other forms of transportation account for about one-third of Canada's greenhouse gas emissions. So, a Canadian company decided it would be a good idea to start making an eco-friendly electric car. But as the CBC's Red Sharon reports, the little Zen car has had a rough ride. This is still the only way you can get a Zen electric car legally moving through downtown Toronto traffic on the back of a trailer. Because we can't drive them in Canada. A few months ago, it looked like Zen had won its battle to share space in low-speed urban environments. Now it has discovered that's not what the federal government has in mind at all. We're very disappointed, actually. We first introduced you to CEO Ian Clifford and his Zen vehicles last October. 100% electric, you simply plug it in and away it goes designed to operate at low speeds in areas where speed limits are restricted to 50 kilometers an hour or less. It is sold in Europe, Asia, and in 45 of 50 American states, but not Canada. Even though it met the government's own regulations, Transport Canada wouldn't grant Zen the necessary documents, a national safety mark. 
and I was told by my officials that no, the certificate hadn't been issued. But after being brought to Minister Lawrence Cannon's attention and raised in the House of Commons, the Zen vehicle is already sold in the U.S., Mexico. Ian Clifford soon received his national safety mark, thinking the worst was behind him, but it may have been short-lived. Transport Canada has now introduced what it calls an updated definition of LSVs, which it says makes it clear that the LSV class was created to meet transportation needs in controlled areas. And a controlled area means that these are areas where LSVs do not share the road with larger, heavier and faster motor vehicles. Ultimately, it's up to the provinces to license low-speed vehicles, but the federal government says it wants to be clear it doesn't want these vehicles to mix with other traffic. Clifford is disappointed. We were hoping that they would be much more supportive and positive uh, and recognize that low-speed vehicles play a vital role in our urban traffic mix. Transport Canada says it is a safety issue that low-speed vehicles like Zen or Dynasty, which used to be made in British Columbia, are not required to meet the same safety standards as other motor vehicle classes. But it also says it has yet to do any crash testing of this type of vehicle, something it now has scheduled for this summer. British Columbia already allows low-speed vehicles in mixed traffic and is now moving to lessen restrictions on their use. Now another province, one with electrical outlets in pretty much every parking spot, says they are also considering low-speed vehicles. Manitoba officials say they are serious about LSVs and expect to make a decision about allowing them on the roadways, mixing with other traffic within months. Red Sharon, CBC News, Winnipeg. Despite the challenges, more Canadian companies are expected to jump on the green bandwagon as global warming becomes more and more of a problem and the search for eco-friendly solutions becomes even more urgent. And that's News in Review. I'm Carla Robinson. Thanks for watching.